Now, I want you to imagine that you're 10 years old, you're talking to a really good friend about this favorite sport, when mid-sentence you get interrupted by them saying, that is not a sport. My whole entire life, I have been told that my favorite sport, cheerleading, is not a sport. Now, I have been cheering since I was practically born due to my, own, my parents owning a cheer gym. I've done every single type of cheer, from sideline to game day to competition. I've competed against many different countries and was even a 2022 bronze medalist. Now, throughout all these stages of my life, I have learned when and when not to argue with people over the controversial subject. However, I have also learned to listen because some people truly do make good points. But most of the time, you can step out when people lack knowledge of the subject. So that brings you to my question. Do people tend to argue because they truly feel passionate about a subject? Or is it, because, or is it due to their lack of knowledge? Now, trust me, I do not desire to have everybody be experts in sharing. There are way too many know-it-alls. Mm -hmm. However, a basic, a, a basic understanding of any subject that you plan on talking about may be able to save you from embarrassment. Far too many times have I been arguing with somebody about cheer, and I, they tell me that's not a sport, and I ask them what kind of cheer they're talking about, and they go blank. Now many times, most people, when they think about cheering, they think about the tall, blonde haired blue-eyed girls dancing around the middle dancing around the middle of the field in Texas with the tiny blue and silver costumes on. These girls are known as the Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders, and they are a poor representation of what cheerleading looks like. Did you know that these girls are actually dancers and not trained cheerleaders? I wouldn't even argue if you said that these girls weren't athletes. I mean, sure, they're trained professionals, and maybe what cheer looked like in the 1960s, but they are a poor representation of what cheerleading looked like in today's world. In the cheer community, there are three main types of cheerleading. Sideline, game day, and competition. With over three million athletes doing, and doing cheerleading around the nation, you are bound to know somebody that has done some, some sort of cheerleading on some sort of level. Sideline is most known due to it being performed throughout most high school and college basketball and football games. Game day is the newest one. It came out about three years ago, and you don't really know about it unless you do it. And competition cheer. Competition cheer is the most up and coming of it all. It is the most sport like and is one of, if not the most controversial sport of our time. It may be also the most under acknowledged. So you're probably thinking to yourself, Tonya, you ramble on and on, yet I have no idea what cheerleading is even made up of, so stick with me. Competition cheer is made up of six different age divisions tinies, minis, youth, juniors, senior, and open with levels one through seven in each of them, except tinies and minis. You can only do the levels one and two in those age divisions. Your whole entire season is based upon a two minute and 30 second routine where you will perform a series of stunts, jumps, pyramids, basket tosses, dances, and tumbling. Unless you're on a non-tumbling team, then you will do everything except tumbling, hence the name. The season starts with tryout. Oh, if you do all this without falling or falling or dropping a stunt, then congratulations, you can zero. If not, then you will get points deducted off of your score, depending on the severity of the fall. The season starts in, with tryouts in the middle of May, and well, it ends in the middle of May. Um, most gyms will give you about two weeks off, but most athletes don't take that time off. From May to practice, from May to August, you will practice with your team. Um, usually, um, that's where your coaches will be able to see where what skills they will they will be able to put in their routine. August in August is choreography, and the competition season starts in December. Throughout the seasons, the season level one through five will try and get a bid to an end of season event like the Summit and All Star Worlds. But for level six and seven, you will try and get a bid to the to the cheerleading worlds. The cheerleading worlds is the most prestigious event in all-star cheerleading, where gyms all around the world compete in many different divisions to win the world champion title. 
Divisions can be upwards of 60 teams, hence why it's such a prestigious competition. Some other honorable mention competitions are cheer sport, NCA, and UCA. NCA and UCA also hold the end of season event nationals for college and high school cheerleading. If you are able to win one of these competitions, you can buy a ring for, for about $400. Did I mention that shooting is incredibly expensive? Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to argue with me that shooting is legally not a sport, you would be correct. However, the cheer community is working on that title. In 2021, cheerleading was recognized by the International Olympic Committee as a sport, and I was actually privileged enough this year to, to witness the International Cheer Union World, where over 70 nations competed in various different divisions to win the world champion title. Now, do not get the cheerleading worlds and the international cheer union worlds mixed up. One is for a competitive private all-star cheerleading and the other one is for countries to compete at. Since it is like the Olympics for cheerleading, there's an opening and closing ceremony and it was quite an experience to be able to see all these countries come out for this and to see the diversity and dedication that all of these athletes all around the world have for this sport. And I'm so grateful to be able to witness it. This is a major step in the right direction for cheerleading. The only thing that is holding children back from taking that final step is this, Title IX. It doesn't matter if you do high school, college, or all-star cheerleading, it will somehow always be impacted by the restrictions of Title IX. Title IX is the law that ensures female, male and female students and employees in educational settings are treated equally and fairly. The U.S. Court of Appeal for the Second Circuit ruled time and time again that cheerleading does not meet the standards, or should I say their standards, of a varsity sport under Title IX. Now, besides having to bear the weight of not having the sport title, Title IX doesn't really stop competitive all-star cheerleading since it's not affiliated with a high school or college. However, for competition high school and college athletes, it allows the schools to treat the students um, like athletes but not obligated to fund them or acknowledge them in general. Most competition high school and college teams practice like any other sport, compete like any other sport, and have to, sometimes have to follow the same student handbook as any other sport. The only difference is that they're expected to pay expensive and basically fend for themselves. I know for a personal fact that the University of Rhode Island cheer team practices like any other sport and even has to follow the same NCAA code of conduct like any other sport. However, they are not granted any medical assistance during practices and competitions. We have to pay for all of our travel and gear, and we're not eligible for any athletic scholarships or compensation. Now, as you can imagine, cheerleading is incredibly dangerous. According to NeuroLifeRehab.com, cheerleading is statistically the most dangerous female sport. I, myself, have attained many injuries, like concussions and broken bones from the sport. A study conducted by the National Center of Catastrophic Resports Injury Research, Catastrophic Sports injury research has counted that college shooting has accounted for 70.5% of all female catastrophic sports injuries in high schools accounted for 65.2%. Since most schools are not obligated to give team a trainer, this is a big issue because athletes can get hurt on school's watch and it's really nobody's problem. If you want me to be completely and totally honest, Title IX not supporting cheerleading is doing more harm than good. The whole law's concept has to do with equality and treating everyone equally except for the over 3 million athletes that participate in cheerleading. Luckily, while cheering here at Brewster, I know that all of my cheer accomplishments will be recognized, but unfortunately, for most cheerleaders, that isn't the case. At the end of the day, I, along with all cheerleaders around the world, have looked alike participating in a very controversial sport. We don't do it because we want to argue with everybody all day, but we do it because we love it. I'm not asking everybody to go sign a petition, although I wouldn't be mad if you would to make cheerleading a sport, but to just think the next time that you talk, you want to argue over a, car, a subject that you're under acknowledged in. Cheerleading may never become a sport while well, I do it, but the more people that know about it and understand it, the more people there are when the time comes to become a sport. Thank you.